Good morning, good afternoon, and good night to all our viewers around the world. My name is Nicholas Simon Christopher. I'm the community manager at the Football Business Academy. And I'll be your moderator for today's session of the FBA Tackles. Thanks again for joining us for session three and welcome if it's the first time for you tuning in. For those of you who haven't heard of the FBA before, we are a Swiss football educational institution entirely focused on the football industry. We run a professional master in football business along with a number of tailor-made football business certificates around the world. Last week's session, women's football challenges and opportunities turned out to be a really insightful and spirited session. Today, this is our third and final session of the series and it will surely, surely be an interesting one. If you missed out on the live stream, don't worry, as you can re-watch the sessions on YouTube, and if you prefer to listen to it on mobile when it's available on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Now, today's topic, the Super League feud. What now? A roundtable discussion. Without further ado, let's meet our guests. First up, we have David Goldblatt, faculty member, history of football, po political, economic, economy of football, writer, broadcaster, and academic extraordinaire. How are you doing today, David? I'm good, thank you. Good to be here. Good to see you. Glad to have you. Next up, we have Olivier Yaros. He's also a faculty member um, in club management, also managing partner at Club Affairs, former ECA head of Club Affairs. Welcome, Olivier. How are you doing? I think it might, Mike might be muted. And then finally, we have up next after Olivier, we have Benoit Pasquier, faculty, law and football, internationalization in football. He's also founder of BP Sports Law, former general counsel and director of legal affairs at Asian Football Confederation, former. How are you doing, Benoit? I'm very good, thank you. Hi, everyone. And last but not least, we have Alexander Maestre. He'll be joining us a bit later because he's a bit caught up in um, court at the moment. He's our faculty member of law and football, ethics and professionalism. He's a sports lawyer at Abreu Avogados and UEFA Governance and Compliance Committee at UEFA. So I'll throw the ball straight off to you, David. Um, so we're here to talk about the big trending topic that's been been plaguing us in the football industry for the last couple of months, the Super League. Um, could you give us a little bit of insight in terms of what and frame a bit the Super League in terms of the fans' reactions and, you know, what, what were people seeing with the Super League from your point of view? Sure. Um, just a bit of history. I think um, many people will know this, but it's worth remembering we've been here before. Um, the notion of some kind of European Super League um, standing outside of UEFA in some way or another has been with us since Berlusconi uh, floated the idea in the late 1980s. And it's proved amongst the um, most powerful um, of European clubs uh, a useful battering ram or form of leverage whenever we come up to thinking about reformatting um, the Champions League and how the money will be distributed and there's no doubt that the original reformatting of the European Cup as the Champions League um, in 1992 was a di direct and defensive riposte to um, Berlusconi's proposals. Um, this one though I think is different. I think it's different in the that we actually had clubs not merely proposing or hiding in the shadows or trying to leverage UEFA, but they actually went for it. And we had some legal documents and we had withdrawals and so on and so forth. Um, what is different again this time, um, particularly in England, and I think this is really interesting, is that we've had a response from fans. In the past, when the Super League has been discussed, it's basically been a conversation and a game among senior administrators, powerful clubs, broadcasters, but fans have not really been involved in the debate or particularly responded to it strongly. Um, but here in England in particular, 
um, the response has been remarkable. I've never seen anything actually quite like it in English football. Um, to just give you a sense of the impact, um, the Today programme, which is broadcast between half past six and nine o'clock in the morning on BBC Radio 4, is the breakfast radio programme of uh, England's elites. Everybody's listening to it. And what happens on that show is an important way of sensing the temperature of political debate. Um, it's also phenomenally conservative. Um, however, I was sitting there eating my breakfast and I heard the presenter challenging the Secretary of State here for Culture, Media and Sport, Oliver Dowdend, uh, no socialist, I can, I can assure you. And he was saying to him in no uncertain terms, how can this be possible? How can you allow football clubs in Britain to make this decision and just depart from English football? How can it be that fans seem to have no stake or no place in their club's governance? What are you going to do about it? Are we going to consider the kind of models that exist in Germany? And the Secretary of State was on the back foot, spluttering and promising a review of the way in which football is governed. That is, that is an extraordinary shift in the terms of the conversation. Um, and it's worth noting for those of you, if you weren't watching, the incredible explosive response from every level of English football to the Super League proposals. Um, most obviously you had fans gathering at football stadiums, you know, in, uh, you know, in contravention of COVID, uh, COVID rules and protesting in no uncertain terms in their thousands. Uh, you know, the Emirates was engulfed in fans and uh, in smoke bombs. Uh, the Manchester United Liverpool game at the end of the Premier League season actually had to be cancelled after Manchester United fans stormed the pitch. Um, beforehand. You had protests at Chelsea, you had protests at Manchester City. Um, so that is unprecedented. And then in football Twitter, you know, for what it's worth, I've never seen quite so much um, being said by quite so many people. And from across the political spectrum, it wasn't just the usual kind of uh, suspects. Um, it was people who usually don't engage in these debates and people who you might think might be quite sympathetic to the kind of market based private sector solutions that the Super League represents to the point um, where uh, at Prime Minister's question time, which is the kind of theatrical high point of the week in the House of Commons, you have the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom having to respond to questions about the European Super League and promise um, that it would, they would, that, you know, Manchester United and Arsenal will not be leaving English football. This is a, a level of political engagement and media coverage that no other country had. Uh, and I think it's really interesting. I mean, and I will be really interested to hear from the others on the panel more about this. But my reading of the situation in Spain and Italy is that amongst fans, there was very little. Uh, complaint. Indeed, there is a constituency, certainly amongst uh, Real Madrid and Barcelona fans, and to an extent amongst the big three in Italy, who have already kind of abandoned their own leagues and are going, well, isn't this good? You know, like, what's the point of being in La Liga anyway? We've outgrown this long ago. We'd much prefer to be in this. Isn't this good for the club? So that kind of logic, I'm not saying it's universal, but you're certainly hearing that amongst some in some quarters. You're not hearing that anywhere in England. And it is remarkable the extent to which the, um, the absence of promotion and relegation is absolutely the thing that freaks most people out. People who would not usually take a position in a, in a, in a sort of politicised debate about football governance saying this is, you know, it's not football. It's not football as we know it. If that, it is absolutely and profoundly alien to um, English, uh, English fan culture. And that runs very, very deep. And one of the consequences of all of this is not only that the big six in England withdrew incredibly quickly um, from uh, the European Super League model, but that you now have a government-backed, um, fan-led review of football governance chaired by an ex-minister of sport. Um, and you have seen an outpouring of activity uh, in English football. Uh, I'm involved, amongst other things, in a group called uh, Fair Game, 
who are an alliance of progressive and socially owned uh, and fan-owned football clubs around the country who are making a very substantial submission on the reordering of governance and finance in English football. And one sees that after, you know, 20 years of the fan movement here and of support of trusts and experiments in social ownership, there's an extraordinary body of knowledge of technical knowledge and sophistication out there, a really high level debate about if we are gonna have change, what might that look like? So that is all, you know, that's very positive. Um, and I think it will make any future Super League is going to have to, is gonna to have to tackle fan power in England and um, people have tasted blood. And I think it's worth no, noteworthy, you know, the Germans weren't on board. Bayern München would not sign up and because they know that they would have faced a backlash even greater, I think, uh, or Borussia Dortmund, my God, I can't imagine what would have happened if they'd have tried to sign up for something like this. So I think it's interesting. The Super League has revealed the differential power of fans in Northern and Southern Europe. And in Northern Europe, they really are stakeholders and are organized enough and loud enough to have a say in this. Whereas in Italy and Spain, um, they seem to have been entirely marginalized and without a sort of critical national voice. And I, I'd be really interested to know more about that. So just to conclude, I think the Super League, a lot of the debate has been about, you know, what the motivations of the big clubs are. are they doing this to get out of debt, how much money they, and that's all important and interesting. But here in England, the idea of the closed league is such anathema that it has ignited uh, a degree of political organisation and opposition to a Super League that I think is going to be very difficult to deal with. I don't care what Florentine Perez has to say on the subject, and I really don't care what Spanish courts have to say <laughs> on the subject. It is not going to fly here in its current, anything close to its current format. Um, and that is the big obstacle that those folks face. And yes, people have forgotten about it, as we were sort of talking about beforehand, because the Euros are happening and no one's thinking about it, and that's the way. But I think this has left quite a deep mark on English football, uh, and it will be difficult to go back from where we are. Well, I'll, I think that that's a good segue to, to, to shift the conversation to yourself, Olivier. I know you had some experience working with the ECA for a number of years, and... Um, you're a managing partner, obviously, at the, at the Club Affairs Association. Maybe you could tell us a little bit more about what's happening behind the scenes and what, how are those negotiations taking place and what it, <coughs> sort of progress or movements have you been seeing, hearing, or what are those stakeholders doing to kind of either push the Super League to continue that project or, or from the other side, like what, what the people are doing on the other side to kind of prevent it from, from going? So good morning, good afternoon, uh, good evening, or good night for those uh, who are about to go to bed. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Nicolas. Thanks, uh, the FBA, for organizing it. I've been listening uh, very carefully, uh, uh, David. Uh, very interesting uh, background. Uh, first of all, I'm not a spokes uh, spokesperson for none of the organizations, so uh, so not here to defend or nor to attack. Obviously, even though we're talking about the football subject. Uh, Obviously, maybe maybe commenting on what David said, then also to generate a bit of debate. It's also very interesting. Is uh, well, obviously, Super League is is like a ghost in the old world world. And, and actually, uh, looking also from a Central European perspective, uh, the separation was always on the table. And I, I, in the past, we had the Mitropa Cup, uh, which actually the so-called Eastern clubs. Uh, did not want to play against the Western clubs because they believe they are the best. So, you know, the Hungarian times, etc. Uh, obviously, uh, Berlusconi, etc., Florentino Perez. And of course, uh, we also had uh, the Football Leagues, which not only publicized on the topic of secret talks about European football, but also mentioned the project and even a specific date. It was August 2021. So, yes, uh, this is historically uh, uh, been on the table. Uh, and also we have some uh, maybe... Uh, example where he kind of succeed uh, the European uh, the English Premier League broke away with two tiers in 92 uh, so you know in, in a way uh, we, we already have uh, example in the past and obviously also now we're looking uh, not only in, in our bubble of football in other industry the likes of, of petrol the organization of petrol oil and 
exporting countries is also created uh, their own uh, group. But I think uh, where I would uh, uh, then I, I fully agree that is uh, a lot of in roots and understanding to be found uh, in, in the past, especially that also from an economic point of view, it kind of makes sense uh, in a way, especially that now COVID uh, made that uh, clubs lost uh, uh, more than 1.5 billion, uh, especially those we, we, we're talking uh, potentially uh, joining the Super League. I think where we tend to disagree with you, uh, David, uh, is actually a bit on the role of, of the fans. Uh, obviously, from an English perspective, we clearly that fans were uh, in the street, uh, not necessarily uh, for the all good reasons. Uh, some some people which are actually holding some some uh, some uh, tickets for uh, for for uh, on a yearly basis, uh, they felt that they will not be able to sell uh, the current tickets. But in any case, um, I do think that uh, fans are obviously plenty of contradiction, and it's very difficult to give them more voice. Especially that, as you witness yourself in Spain and Italy, they were rather in favor because, in the end, they want us to win games. Um, where, where, where we we also saw recently banners in Africa showing that they are against uh, the Super League, uh, the African Super League. So, I guess you know, uh, from a fans, uh, you might have ten fans, you might have uh, eleven opinion uh, to make a joke. But I guess um, it's very interesting uh, the Super League uh, discussion. Uh, especially now, because uh, Euro, uh, now the European Cup is really kind of helping to kind of almost forget uh, the situation. Uh, and I would agree that, in a way, public opinion saved, uh, saved certainly um, uh, UFR more than UFR saved itself, in reality, because what has been done by the different uh, governing bodies and stakeholders uh, to prepare actually the, the repost uh, in order to think, because if we know historically that it would have happened, what do we do to prepare? Uh, and the kind of answer is the European Champions League with 36 clubs, which is actually 180 games instead of 96 in the first phase. So obviously, in reality, sometimes it's about uh, how you define what is a Super League and uh, is it just the definition of being closed? Um, if we look on paper, um, the next formats also are, are kind of limiting the, the possibility for, for clubs to access. Uh, but yeah, I guess where uh, I have first point doubt on, uh, on, on the fans, even though uh, they play the major role, uh, because obviously the club seems to join this uh, Super League and they also left for the same reasons, uh, so for public and commercial reasons. Uh, and yeah, I guess uh, there's a lot to say, but uh, uh, we could not uh, agree more on saying that uh, from a communication perspective, uh, it has been a bit of a, of a, of a fail, obviously. Uh, uh, I have the feeling that maybe in a few months they will be almost wiped out. But uh, I was uh, I'm sorry because we started kind of holiday period and I've been... Uh, watching recently a, a kind of uh, a movie uh, and the whole reminds me of this movie I don't know if guys if you, if you recall uh, The Sixth Day uh, starring Arnold Schwarzenegger so it's it's a kind of uh, uh, old old movie uh, there is a, actually uh, just to set the scene you have Tony Goldwyn who plays uh, as a joker the CEO of Replacement Technologies and he manages to clone himself uh, before he dies uh, but the malfunctioning equipment causes that uh, the, the so-called new drucker clone is incomplete and extremely deformed. And, and in the Super League story, I think uh, it happened really on the 18th of April. Probably the, the, the cloning exercise was not supposed to be finished or finalized on the 18th. It happened they were caught by uh, movement. It happened so fast because there was a discussion set to take place in Montreux, but also defining... Uh, the future of uh, club competition, the joint venture, etc. And uh, yeah, in, in the Super League story, I think the, 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 only the ECA president seems to be a bit uh, of a victim as uh, he left also. Um, but what actually uh, the whole uh, ended. And, and, um, and I think this is, this is something which is, which is also very interesting to put in perspective because Super League is also a kind of answer an accelerator of what happened in in COVID times, uh, and certainly 
some recent research has also showed that kind of a challenge of the new generation, etc. And here there is a risk of again opening uh, new doors, but uh, uh, obviously and maybe giving a link to to Benoit. I think uh, the Super League has been well prepared in a way, uh, and if GP Morgan. Uh, and outstanding lawyers were involved is probably because they believe that this project could uh, could be successful. Well, that's a good um, tie into uh, for for Benoit, as you mentioned. Um, Benoit, you spent some time in in, in the Asian region, and you worked uh, very closely with the the AFC over there. And um, correct me if I'm wrong, there was a a similar sort of competition, a Super League type competition that that was proposed and then it eventually didn't really take off. Could you tell us a little bit about that and maybe what sort of parallel similarities there were there? And then why was that probably not as successful in comparison to the European one where there's still three clubs who are pushing for it to, to, to still launch? Yes, absolutely, Nicolas. So just uh, as a background, um, I joined the AFC in 2013 as a general counsel and director of legal affairs. And already at that time in 2013, there were some discussions in the Southeast uh, Asian uh, region uh, between the, the football association. It wasn't between clubs, it was between the football associations. And in that region, you have 12 football associations and those football associations are uh, organized within the ASEAN Football Federation. And that federation uh, obviously had discussions with those federations and they wanted actually to uh, to raise the level of food, club football in the region because according to them, the, the domestic leagues were not doing well. And then the clubs that qualified for the uh, AFC club competitions, the AFC uh, Champions League and the AFC Cup were not competitive. So meaning they were uh, always, um, they always lost their first, first few matches and they, they couldn't progress in the competition. So reason why, uh, those football federations in the ASEAN uh, region decided to start that project of the ASEAN Super League. And at the beginning, uh, they said it would be franchise club. And then moving forward uh, through the years, in 2015, they came to, to the AFC and said, no, it's going to be uh, existing clubs. Uh, they won't leave the domestic league. They will play. Uh, the ASEAN Super League uh, in the calendar ac around the, the, the match days of the AFC Champions League and AFC uh, Cup uh, matches. So we invited them to, uh, to come to the AFC house and have a first discussion with them just to understand the project. And obviously the project was more of developing football in the region, pushed by the football association, not by the clubs. I don't know and whether the clubs were uh, consulted uh, at that time, just to understand if, yes, they were agreeable to, to that project to play in an additional uh, club, a continental club competition. And uh, obviously, we had also some good governance uh, questions because according to the legal uh, framework uh, of the FIFA, AFC, UEFA framework, they all uh, mirror each other's. Um, leagues have to be affiliated to a member association. So a domestic league has to be affiliated and recognized by a member association. So in a continental league, there is already an issue here. You have actually who's that league is going to be affiliated to which association. Okay, in that particular case would be the ASEAN Football Federation, but it's not a member association. So already here, there are some discussions to be held whether it will be in breach of, uh, of the FIFA or AFC or UEFA statutes. And then obviously, where the players, because we always talk about the clubs, but what about the players? Did, did they have a say in those projects? Because uh, a player might be more willing to play in the domestic league and have better chance than to be uh, selected for the national team. Uh, we always play about talk about clubs, but what, what about the, the the players? So there in in Asia, we ask them, okay, did you consult the players? How do you organize uh, that consultation? And uh, also, we had some other questions about uh, who's going to be in charge of uh, refereeing. Have you uh, decided who you're going to appoint? Is going to be official referees from Asia or from your domestic league? 
uh, who's going to do conduct the anti-doping control? Is it an uh, independent body? Uh, who's going to conduct the disciplinary proceedings? Because they came with their project and they couldn't answer to all those questions, unfortunately, at the first time. And uh, we were not against. I think we were quite open for, uh, for an open discussion with them because we thought, okay, it's something to develop football in, uh, in the region. It wasn't financially driven. So, which in my opinion, it's, it's very important. If we can develop football in a different manner, that's, that's even better. But at the end of the day, I think we had some, some issues and some questions that they had to work on and the, the project went silent afterwards. But I understand that now there are some discussions coming back because I guess on the, on the project of the European League. So I think it's going to be uh, interesting uh, in the few uh, few next month uh, to see uh, whether in Asia or in Africa now I've read that uh, there is a project uh, that uh, the new president must set it, put on the table for an African uh, Super League. But again, players should be consulted mm. because if those clubs are playing, if those clubs are not leaving the domestic league, but are playing in addition to the domestic league, to the continental uh, official uh, competition, and plus the Super League, that's going to be uh, very challenging for, for their welfare. Yeah, that's a really good um, a really good expression of, what, of that situation and the factors that need to be considered. Um, Alexander, welcome to the conversation. Thank you, Mike. Thank Hello, you. Nicholas and everybody. Apologize. I'm not every day at the court, but today I was at the court and uh, since early morning, but unfortunately, and a nice skating case, by the way, but uh, unfortunately, uh, it was supposed to end uh, at lunch, but it took more time. Apologize. Hi, David. Hi, Olivier. Hi, Benoit. Um, I, I, I hope I will not speak about something that you've already uh, no but already... I think um, I think you've jumped in at, at a pretty good um, point because Benoit was explaining to us a bit of um, some of the similarities that the Super League had in the Asian version of the Super League and then some of the legal considerations that had to be taken into account because um, I think that ties into a bit of some of the work that you, you do and maybe you could speak about um, some of the legal aspects that that all of the stakeholders need to consider from the players to the associations, FIFA, UEFA, how do those things kind of stand up in court? And wh where is that at the moment now? And then where is it going in the future? Well, um, I'm, I'm, uh, it's going to be really a challenge for, for the European Court of Justice to, 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 dis to decide. It was very interesting to, to see that uh, everything started in a, in a Spanish court and now we're going to wait to see how it's going to be developed in Luxembourg. Um, you, you you ask about what is going to be the future within the current model. The thing is, is the current model going to re to remain in the upcoming uh, the upcoming years? There's a big a big uh, a big issue there. But in my opinion, I'm 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 against. Uh, to be really honest, I'm I'm against uh, the creation of a parallel parallel league, at least in this in this uh, in this in this model. Uh, I'm still defending the European uh, sports model, and I think that uh, we should look to the treaty to the treaty of the function of the European Union. There was a reason to introduce in this treaty. It took a long time to introduce this uh, provision, Article 165 of the treaty. Uh, introducing, the, introducing the wording promotion of European sporting issues. If we're talking about promotion of European sporting issues, if we're talking about European dimension of sport, it means that there is an European sports model. So there is a pyramidal model, a natural monopoly in which we have a single uh, a federation per sport. Why do we have a single federation per sport? Because we need indeed universal rules. Benoit was talking precisely uh, about that. Uh, if we create another league, what are we going to have? Different kind of footballs? No, different rules of the game. Yes, we can say it is possible to have football 
driven by different organizations, a different regulation, different regulations for intermediaries. Okay, different reg disciplinary rules, different ethical rules, different governance rules, different transfer rules, but different rules of the game. That could be the, the, the first question. How can we have universal rules? How can we have different case law? We have CAS always deciding based on the uniformization of the rules of football in case of having a parallel organization out of the umbrella of CAS, namely, you, we're going to have definitely another sport. The unicity of football as, as well as the unicity of other uh, sports, there is a reason for that. We have a natural monopoly and I still defend that uh, monopoly, but still on this article, why do we have promotion of fairness and openness in sporting competitions? Because we need sports merit, we need promotion relegation, we need competitive balance and certainty of results. Closed leagues are exactly the, op uh, the opposite of openness. Why do we have in this provision the expression taking account of the specific nature of sport? Because the, spe the specificity of sport exists and the case law um, makes several references to that. The regulations of FIFA make express reference to um, the specificity of sport. This also means that we must look to football differently from other sectors of activity. If we have only a business, we don't have specificity. And once again, Article 165, we have other expression very important, social and educational function of sport. Social and educational. We talk about solidarity between the top and the basis of the pyramid, between professional and grassroots, redistribution, sustainability, like financial fair play focus on sustainability. If we have only a model of business, where is redistribution? Where is solidarity? Where is the future of grassroots? In this context, it's going to be very important to see what is, what is going to be the, 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 the final outcome of, of the European Court of, of Justice. Um, but there's, there is also, and to, to end my, my intervention, there is also something that for me is very, very important. Not only to know if the court is going to say the current model, the current rules uh, are not restrictive in, on grounds on, of competition. There is no abuse of dominant position of UEFA or FIFA. But it's going to be very important to know also what is, what is the opinion of the court regarding the new model. Because if we're talking about restricting of competition, the new model restricts even more competition while compared to the current one. But if the current one restricts competition, in my opinion, it's objectively justified due to those specificities of sport. But there's, there is an ethical dimension here too. Why creating a new and parallel competition suddenly, unexpectedly, nobody was uh, uh, waiting for this. And Benoit was putting the finger of one of the main issues here, the role of the players. How can we say domestic competitions will remain? Objectively, I don't know how we can combine calendars between um, uh, how, parallel competitions, domestic competitions, and also the Super League. But the players, national teams, means that the players are represented through international federations. The national team of Portugal that unfortunately is no longer at Euro means that the players, the national players of Portugal were represented through the Portuguese Football Association. If those players are, will play out of the umbrella of FIFA, out of the pyramid, they will no longer participate in the national teams. And for instance, in Portugal, participating in national teams means public interest in accordance with our law. Where is the, where is the final um, consequences for the players? This must be sought. Uh, this must be negotiated. That's why we have social dialogue. I don't advocate something done 
uh, through this methodology. I prefer negotiation and convergence. Well, I, I really do like that you brought up all of these points because the, I think it kind of begs the question to figure out like, well, why did the whole Super League kind of debacle come out? Like what, what drove it, what motivated it? And was it just to, to break the mold or was it just for the financial gain? Maybe or the economic um, challenges, you know? Maybe Olivier, you could speak to that on that part of that, that sort of motivation for, for this to come and kind of change the whole dynamic of what we've grown accustomed to. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Nicolas. Thank you, Alexandre. I think uh, the, the perception is that national association tried to actually convince the public that they were really working to defend uh, football. And some club presidents are, are su supported by greedy banks wanted to destroy it. But I think we have to come back to the debate. It's not obviously black and white. Uh, it's somewhere gray. Uh, and in reality, uh, the UFI interest and the Super League interest are, are exactly the same. Uh, that's why it also creates some tension, not to call it family bugs. But what I, what I, well, what I would like to mention is it's also from an economic perspective because today uh, we will also have to understand uh, the club owners. Uh, the 12 clubs uh, lost around, as I said there were before, around 1.5 billion euro uh, so far in the COVID-19 and this in the first year of the pandemic. Uh, we see that football viewership and especially also Champions League is really going down in some countries. In some countries, is even up to 80%. And, and I think it's, uh, it's very uh, also a situation where uh, the breakout uh, that has certainly a, a legal uh, background, very important, and, and thanks for clarifying it, uh, Alexandre, I still do believe that the issues that we are kind of have to accept that the current football ecosystem is being very much challenged, not only by Netflix or Google, even though uh, they are playing their role also to take the, the, the viewership. On the other side, uh, the new uh, way of consuming football is also dramatically changing by different age categories. And also, actually, we have to realize that some, uh, some sports are uh, being challenged and also being maybe disappearing. Uh, I was reading recently a history of boxing, where it seems to be in the 30s, in the 50s, in the 70s, it was a uh, sport number one uh, amongst many, many, many young generation today. Yes, we can say MMA replaced it. And actually, maybe esports might, 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 might replace football. But I think this is where uh, all the different stakeholders within the football world needs to um, take a common decision and agree where they want to go. Because uh, obviously, players was not consultant, and I'm sure if club owners would have discussed with players before uh, preparing themselves, I'm pretty sure that Cristiano Ronaldo would say, "Yeah, my next dream is to win uh, the Super League Cup." So I, I, I really doubt that, uh, that 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 it's uh, just 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 on 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 positions. It's obviously what is the best for fans, what is the best for or for UEFA, what is the best for FIFA, what is the best for TV uh, commercials, for uh, media rights, for banks also. And this is where it becomes very, very complicated and we tend to look from just one perspective. But I, I really do think that um, the, the, the common issue here is about how um, clubs also are organized and managed because it goes down a, a lot of around sustainability and why your Super League and we saw already Florentino Perez saying uh, recently that because of uh, the Super League uh, uh, postponement, because he clearly said this, the project is just postponed, I'm not able to buy Mbappé and uh, Kevin Hannan, um, which, which kind of clearly says that, you know, it's just, uh, uh, it, just uh, it was just to get more revenues to pay more players. But in the end, the money goes outside of the bull ecosystem. David, you have something to add on that? You're on mute as well. Thank you. I'm here. Uh, it was great to hear the comments from everybody. I've been really enjoying listening to all the perspectives. Um, I just think it's worth injecting this idea of, you know, that the old model is broken. And I think the old model is broken, but the, that, the idea 
that generating more money for the top 12 clubs is somehow going to lead to better economic decision making, more balanced internal governance is completely laughable. All they're going to do is spend it all over again. It's not going to deal with any problems of sustainability. It won't deal with any problems of debt. Look at Florentine Perez. I mean, it's like, oh, I can't buy Mbappe. It's like, good. That's really good news because then at least we have a bit more competition inside European football. That's exactly what we don't want to happen. These people are so disingenuous. And I have to say, just economic, um, it's all wrapped up in the level of, uh, of sort of a strange economic determinism. You know, we haven't got enough money. We need more money. You know, COVID is making things impossible. And it's like, dudes, you've got more money than you've ever had in history. Your income in a year is what you used to pull in in a decade. The problem is not more money. The problem is that you have a model where you can't control your costs. If you control your costs, then nobody in football needs any more money. All the players and all the agents and all the executives at the top level are earning sensational money. No one needs any more money. It doesn't, that is absolutely not what is required. A reform of the way in which the money is spent is what is required. Well, One other thing yeah. I'm going to introduce into this conversation is that point about um, new fans and old fans. I mean, I really think there is a kind of division in, you know, what is good for uh, an 18 year old in Shanghai and what is good for a season ticket holder at Arsenal who's been going for the last 40 years. And who do we prioritise in this? And what are the mechanisms for doing so? I'm of the belief that football clubs actually only have any value or have any meaning because you have people whose personal narratives and experience are bound to it. That's what makes watching it interesting. And I think if we destroy that by orientating the thing entirely to a global audience, in time, the meaning and value of these institutions will diminish. I do, you know, what is part, you know, that's what makes these clubs actually have value and interest. And I think that we will lose, if we lose that, they just become hollow shells. And sure, that'll work for a decade. Where are we in 20 or 30 years with that? I simply, I simply don't see that as a good business move. And just finally, on the point about whether fans, you know, uh, Olivia made the point, well, fans have 10 different opinions. And you go, oh, unlike football executives, who are all so united and so smart and so sharp. These are the people who brought us Project Big Picture, perhaps the most incompetent and useless set of governance reforms ever introduced into football. You know, with people whose political antennae are those of a slug. And we're meant to take these people seriously about their motivations and their attitudes to governance. I find it very hard not to be deeply and profoundly cynical about these people's interests and their competence. Well, guys, given that you brought that up so eloquently, um, do you, maybe Benoit, you could start, or any of you guys have opinions of how we can probably fix or try to sort that issue in terms of like bringing maybe a balance to to this conversation because obviously you know the the money is driving a lot of these decisions and fans maybe are being left out but like how do we find that middle ground between helping keeping the healthy economic environment that is football and then like keeping and connecting that dot and not leaving behind other clubs and other fans then well maybe you could chime in to start. I, I, I might just have one one comment on the on the fans' involvement in the decision making process of, of those clubs to 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 join the Super League. Uh, if I'm not wrong, correct correct me. Uh, I think FC Barcelona they have a social uh, membership, so meaning any decision is passed, a uh, main decision are passed by like a general assembly of of the club. So I I would be interested to know whether that decision to join the Super League was presented to the socios. Because that's a completely uh, decision that has a huge impact on the club and obviously on the socios. So the, the people who are paying their membership to be a socios or a member of the club. So I would be very interested to know whether that uh, decision was put forward in front of the General Assembly to have a take on that, uh, on that participation to the European Super League. Uh, just two small uh, remarks on the sustainability that uh, both Olivier and David uh, highlighted. Uh, well, precisely, 
I have my doubts if a parallel competition without a regulation fixing a limit for the investments, like the current financial fair play regulations, the current system of licensing in other con continental confederations, I have my doubts that without a limit to invest, what would be the consequences? I agree with David. Uh, there will be kind of an escalation of, of investment, spending more money. And this is not exactly healthy for, for, for football, in my opinion. However, there are some issues in the American model that I consider positive. If there is a parallel competition, a system like a draft or a salary cap can be positive in order to try to um, balance a little bit the situation. As to the fans, it's interesting because the former G14, when, when for the first time we, we heard about the possible creation of a parallel uh, league, in that moment, the word of decision-making process was there because those clubs, those big clubs were saying, we need to have more words to say. We don't intervene in the decision-making process. We need to have a word in the calendar, a word on TV rights, a word. So paradoxically or not, nowadays, the, the fans are invoking exactly a word. We need a word to say. We need uh, uh, to intervene in the decision-making process. So it's very curious that uh, the governance issue uh, democracy, um, how to participate in, uh, in the decisions is, 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 is on the agenda. It's very, very interesting. Olivier, anything to add? Well, uh, I would tend to kind of uh, also because it's a debate uh, as it meant to be, uh, I would tend to disagree that more regulation will be helpful because obviously in the last few years, we had more and more. Uh, certainly on finances, maybe it's better, but overall, I think uh, the more rules you do, uh, the more bureaucracy you create and the more difficulty you generate for smaller size clubs. Because obviously, if you look at uh, uh, regulation for European football, at least, they really became heavier and heavier and also penalizing, for example, women's club football, those who are, who are standalone. So I'm, I'm not a strong believer that more regulation will sell, uh, solve everything. But I clearly see that this is uh, certainly a wake-up call for, for many of the smaller leagues um, because the big clubs have really shown that uh, they are more after, after more money. Uh, and so, so, so now it's actually going to be a period of, of readjustment and, and a pause, I guess. Uh, but this time, I think really the countries, the likes of Switzerland, uh, Sweden... Uh, Poland need to really prepare and develop and and believe that they have aligned football values. And recently we saw that actually they tried to uh, create a bundle to sell uh, the broadcasting rights together. So maybe uh, this is how they should think about the potential, how they can develop and uh, what is their position in the football ecosystem. Because obviously we will not be able to force uh, anyone to stay within the, the so-called European club football system. Uh, but at the end, it's actually the question is how you generate strategies, how do you take, uh, how they are taken, because in reality, I do think that if we, if no actions in the next, uh, I don't know, three, maybe five years, um, it's going to happen again, and it will really decimate those who, who, who have not worked to build up their own structures and just relied on, on your, your UFA money, for example. So I think... Uh, uh, now the the, the 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 super league clubs uh, understood the arguments of the others, and now they will prepare during this pause to, to be stronger. But this this is where we really need to think uh, that it's not about just uh, getting the, the bigger chunk of the cake, but uh, how to we slice it uh, efficiently because obviously the cake cannot be bigger and bigger because obviously we're limited and, and football is not just in itself. So what happened in April shows us that where we really need to, to have rejoining of path between football, uh, the game, uh, and, and, and its institutions. Well, yeah, because go ahead, I, Alexander. Yeah, just to say that I, I do agree with Olivier in the sense that uh, there is still a gap between the bigger clubs and uh, the smaller clubs. Uh, and I, 
for instance, I, I do think that the regulation, the financial fair play regulations need to be revised in some parts because we do need to have a, a better model in order to converge the bigger and the smaller. But if we have a parallel league, we're going to have a gap, a big gap be between the biggest of the big, if, I, if it's correct in English, and the remain clubs. It's and already huge. It's already huge, Alexandre. You can't do anything. It's already, but it. It, it's going to be even worse. I don't know. Probably, yeah. Well, you know, what does it change that your your salary is increased by ten percent when you know what Elon Musk is making? You know, it's another I, it's another galaxy. David, you know, in in Serbia for TV rights per game you take one thousand euro per game. So even if you double by ten, it's yeah. peanuts for for Super League club. David, yeah, I mean, I think the point Olivia has been making that the gap, particularly between the small leagues and the big leagues is a really huge issue. It's not just small clubs and big clubs. It's, you know, like, what is the future for the Serbian league in this context or the Danish league? So that's one issue. I just wanted to raise, and I'm interested to again, know what everybody else thinks, that one thing, it seems to me, the English Premier League has done very successfully is that by dividing the uh, overseas sales hitherto equally between the 20 clubs, um, it, has, it has ensured that the level of competitiveness on a game-by-game -game basis um, for the bottom half of the league is pretty good. Um, you know, I mean, this is, a, uh, as my friends in Africa would say, you know, sure, we love to watch La Liga, you know, when it's the Clasico, but like really Catafe versus Osasuna, like we're not watching. But West Ham versus, you know, Crystal Palace, they're there. That for them is going to be guaranteed entertainment. And I wonder, you know, the fact that the clubs at the bottom of the Premier League have still got $150 million budgets because of that. Um, you know, it doesn't mean that Crystal Palace is going to win the Premier League, but it means that on a game by game basis, you're getting a better quality of balanced competitive entertainment. And I just put that out as a relatively simple solution in a lot of it doesn't deal with the problem of what happens to Serbia but that gap between top and bit big and uh, medium and smaller clubs in the top leagues that seems to be part of the solution I think David here the answer is kind of simple as because uh, they made some decision 15 20 years ago also with the creation of the European uh, the English Premier League sorry as well as the statutes. If you read carefully the statutes of the English Premier League, I'm not too sure you would be able to get such a formula now if they would have uh, negotiated. Just impossible. So uh, the good thing that happening now is all that some decisions were taken uh, 20 years ago. So 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 it would it's it's very difficult. And in the end, they really manage uh, English Premier League to become the kind of NBA of European soccer, European football. Uh, and they are really the best in what they do. So obviously uh, they manage to have the best players, the best coaches, and today the best team in uh, the worst, the, the last team in the English Premier League gets what the French uh, winner of the French Ligue 1 uh, gets. The last team of the uh, Ligue 1 gets more than the Hungarian uh, winner of TP Liga, and the last of Hungarian uh, League gets more than the winner of the Latvian Liga. Uh, this is where we live. Uh, in that is our a brilliant football. set of statistics. I will definitely be stealing those from you. That's really interesting. <laughs> well, no, but yeah, keeping that in mind, I mean, Benoit, well, from your side, right? Given that the clubs that wanted to participate in the Super League, they were they so much more financially um, s strong. You know, they could really come back and really kind of push it, push that alternative league in. But in your experience in in the Asian region. The circumstances were different, and that led to obviously maybe that league not being able to to to, to launch. You know, so how how is that? How important is that parallel in terms of those clubs having that individual financial power to kind of demand and then stand up to UEFA or the other federations to kind of maybe push that change for themselves, or maybe the change that we all need to kind of rethink the whole pyramid or the whole structure as it as it stands. More money doesn't mean more sustainable. <laughs> yeah, true. And 
just talking from an Asian perspective and as a governing body in Asia, uh, where we were also very worried or our commercial partners were very worried when they, they knew about the, that project of having a continental club competition competing against uh, the AFC Champions League and uh, the AFC Cup because those commercial uh, partners had the exclusivity on those on those uh, territories to uh, to sell and market the the rights, uh, the broadcasting rights, the sponsorship rights, the ticketing rights, and so on. So we had also the backing of our commercial partners saying, "Look, guys, if you don't go against that project, we won't have any exclusivity anymore. So we might." Uh, review our fee that we are paying you for the media rights, sponsorship rights, and so on. So we had also to expose that to the football associations in the, in the Asian region to tell them, look, if you come up with a new continental competition, they might be against uh, our commercial partner values and uh, interests. And obviously it will put the AFC uh, commercially at risk and obviously indirectly the member association because since uh, the AFC and also FIFA UEFA are non-profit organization all the money goes back to the member association for the development projects so developing football so that was our take and we were able to convince them hopefully at that time uh, but obviously that project was also backing backed by uh, by a financial promoter and I'm sure that it, it's still in the pipeline somewhere and I'm sure it will come back very soon. So uh, the commercial driven projects are, are very interesting, especially in that region because there is a huge fan base. Uh, the rivalry between the, the football association is huge. If you look at all the, also the, the spectators mix, misconducts we had in the past uh, between uh, in matches between clubs from Indonesia, Thailand or Singapore, you can see that fans are there. So there is potential, but the, the road to that uh, to a super Asian super league is long, and obviously you need to discuss first uh, with the right stakeholders instead of coming with a project already uh, finalized and just requesting the approval from the governing body in the region. Okay. I think that's super interesting because it, it really does show the difference in the regions and how how the impact it it, it could have. Um, well. Guys, any final sort of thoughts that you guys want to bring up or share given, you know, this conversation that we've had so far or your experiences with dealing with organizations that are kind of trying to manage their way through the whole Super League situation? Alexander, maybe you want to... Because uh, I, ju I just wanted to emphasize the, the last words, one of the, some of the last words of Benoit. Uh, FIFA and UF are not for profit uh, uh, organizations. Of course, they have huge profits, but in the sense that they have to reinvest the money in the development of football. Of course, we can discuss if they reinvest, each one of us would defend probably a different model of investment or not. But one thing is sure. Uh, they have to reinvest in the promotion of football. A company, a commercial company that is designed to create an entertainment uh, and commercial product in which football is included is an entity that is going to distribute dividends among uh, the shareholders not only promoting football. So we have a difference here. Of course, if we read, if we read some statements by this uh, entity, we read that female football is one of their priorities in the upcoming years. I do believe that if this is going to be a reality, they will also invest in female football, in the promotion of football, etc. I'm not saying that they not going to take care of the product and the different sides of the product, but we cannot compare an association to, um, to a company, to an undertaking. Okay. David? Um, my only thought, of the uh, final thought is, first of all, how great it was to hear about um, consulting the players. I think that's, they're always left out of these conversations. Um, and it's, uh, I think, yeah, let's hear what they've got to say about it. They're the people who've actually got to do it. And other people have to spend an awful lot of time on aeroplanes as well. Yeah. I would like to hear 
them. And I think it is a general problem with football governance as a whole, not just on this issue, that such little space is actually made for the player's voice um, in formal governance, in football associations, in football federations. That's a whole nother topic about how that can be organised and mobilised. Um, so I'm just going to leave it. I think there are a lot of lessons for governance here. Um, you know, the power of fans remains actually in Northern Europe pretty significant. Um, and I think that's a good thing. More of it, please. Awesome. Benoit? Well, I think uh, I totally agree with David. The players are hockey because at the end of the day, uh, the show is because of them on the pitch. So they should be consulted. Uh, it shouldn't be they are part of the, the, the pyramid, uh, even though we say they are at the bottom, but they should actually be at the top. So uh, let's let's hear them. I'm happy that uh, that FIF Pro is uh, is being very active. Uh, I think a few also uh, national association of uh, football players issued statements uh, in respect to the European uh, Super League. So let them. Hear. We need to hear them. We need to to hear their uh, their worries. Their uh, because already now their their calendar is very busy. So uh, if you add more matches, that's going to be terrible for them and for well for their well uh, welfare. So uh, I think it's important that they should be part of the decision-making process uh, for such kind of, uh, of project. Awesome. And Olivier, we'll tie it up with you. <laughs> Thank you. No, obviously, as I said, uh, it's a good time to rejoin PAF uh, between governance, uh, uh, games and institution, obviously, and uh, we need to involve all stakeholders, also clubs, because also clubs are trapped uh, in the situation and got caught. Uh, and clubs belongs uh, to whom? This is maybe another topic for a webinar. But certainly, you know, we need to understand the club perspective because risks are very much taken also by clubs. It's not because 10 or 12 or 15 or whatever number of clubs that generate one third of the revenues today should be accountable for the whole. Uh, ecosystem, uh, etc. And it's thanks to clubs also, players are growing, fans are following, uh, etc. But I think uh, maybe to, to comment, uh, and also I really do think that it's very important from, from a non-English perspective, but I think in the Super League, uh, beyond the fact that the English clubs uh, made the, the, the real complicated project when they left one by one, I think the, the key learning is that the politicians were involved. Uh, very strongly and Boris Johnson government played really a key role it put a huge pressure on the club uh, with no concern on European regulation which is also maybe in a way a good thing of, of Brexit uh, that made uh, possible to kill the Super League uh, but, uh, but clearly you saw for example in France uh, Macron in, in Italy uh, Mario Draghi who were involved in this but clearly from uh, for, 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 for people listening us now the influence of politicians uh, saying to club owners beyond sponsors, obviously, and commercials that might be counterproductive from a PR point of view. The politician, the government said, listen, guys, this is not even though there is an economic rationale, it doesn't fully belong to you. And be careful. Uh, we are your watchmaker. And maybe this is uh, beyond what Alexandre said around the European Treaty, uh, the, the sociological history that uh, uh, David you mentioned and, and previous experiences which uh, you cannot just give to certain clubs the possibility to own it. I think really uh, we have to be aware that politics will, and politicians uh, from non-football governing bodies uh, will suddenly play a bigger role. So we have to keep an eye on some ministry of sports in the future, if not higher. Awesome. Yeah, well summed up. Um, well, first of all, um, to you all, our FBA faculty members, I do, I want to take the time to say that, you know, I think we had a really great conversation. Um, thanks for sharing all your insights. I <laughs> think super valuable. Um, and it, it's very interesting to hear from all the different points of view where and how this sort of polemic topic is, is going and where, I don't know where it might land up in the future because we, we, we're, we're not exactly sure at the moment. Um, so I just want to say thanks to, to you all on behalf of the Football Business Academy for taking your time out to, to share your thoughts and your wisdom on the topic. Um, 
I want to say thanks to the audience for taking time out and following conversation. I'm hope hoping that you all took some interesting nuggets of information as well. And, you know, you learned a little bit more about the, the whole situation involving the Super League. Um, feel free to leave some comments and some insights that you thought was super interesting as well. Um, and don't forget to follow our LinkedIn page and then subscribe to YouTube because we'll probably be doing some of these webinars in future so guys from our side thank you very much if you guys want to just say a last goodbye lovely to have Bye. you thank you so much been really interesting thank you lovely very much to you guys all take care one day see you yes. in the flesh maybe yeah fingers crossed absolutely bye bye thank you okay thank you very thank much you. guys and we'll talk see you guys take next care. time later